our friend Alexandros Marinos shared this with us in the Evening Standard. Up to 300,000 people facing heart-related illnesses due to post-pandemic stress disorder warned physicians. Yes. Post-pandemic stress disorder. You may not have heard of this yet, but PPSD is a well-known uh, and established medical diagnosis since, oh, probably early 2022 was my guess. Um, you know, which is to say, not yet. This thing doesn't exist. Post-pandemic stress disorder, so named to sound like post-traumatic stress disorder, and it will have more or less the same acronym with just one letter different, um, isn't a thing yet. Um, yeah, that's Boris Johnson. We don't need to look at him. Um, this, so PPSD, post-pandemic stress disorder, this could result in a 4.5% rise in cardiovascular cases nationally because of the effects of PPSD, with those aged between 30 to 45 most at risk, they claim. There are, of course, other reasons to expect a rise in... I think I got it. Oh, really? You yes. got this? Um, one of the symptoms of, is it PPSD? Sure. Is lyocarditis. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, mm-hmm. Oh my God. I mean, this, this, this article is just so insane. Here we go. Uh, you can, you can keep my screen on here, Zach. Uh, a senior vascular surgeon said, I've seen a big increase in thrombotic related vascular conditions in my practice. Far younger patients are being admitted and requiring surgical and medical intervention than prior to the pandemic. I believe many of these cases are a direct result of the increased stress and anxiety levels caused from the effects of PPSD. We also have evidence that some patients have died at home from conditions such as pulmonary embolism and myocardial infarction. I believe this is related to many people self-isolating at home with no contact with the outside world and dying without getting the help they needed. I mean, maybe just like leave that there. It's so freaking obvious, but... Epicycles are back, baby. It's really extraordinary <clears throat> that a piece like this with a newly made up medical condition that my guess is, I don't know when the next, I don't even know what the equivalent of the DSM is for physical conditions, actually, or maybe it would go in the DSM, right? Um, and I don't know, this is the UK, does the UK use the DSM? I don't even know. But the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, yep. I guess is what the DSM stands for, has updates every, I don't know, five to 10 years, something like this. And um, PTSD made it into the manual at some point. And um, if it's due for an update soon, I'll bet they forced this one in there. Yeah. And they then list as one of the uh, symptoms of it, all of these heart conditions, thus putting, I don't know, the cart before the horse, the symptoms of something else entirely as diagnostic of this made up thing um, that they can then say, oh, look at all these people who have suffered. Look at all of the indirect effects of the coronavirus. Well, this is an indirect effect of the coronavirus, but it's an indirect effect almost certainly of the coronavirus in that it is almost certainly a large number of these things are an effect of the only treatment we are allowed to talk about for the coronavirus. Yeah, it... it, it you can see if you're standing anywhere other than where they expect you to stand, you can see that the point is the conclusion walk through the door. And no matter what the evidence is that emerges, the point yeah. is it's going to be shoehorned into pointing at that conclusion. Even if they've got to make up disorders, they're going to normalize stuff. You know, kids have strokes too. Really? No, really not. No, um, they don't actually. Sorry. No. Um, hey, did I mean, you I'm see I'm not this? saying never, but for God's sake. On the side of a bus? Um, yeah, this wasn't on the side of the bus, but this was in the Sunday New York Times uh, so last last week. The kids section, you know, there's a, there's a special kids section in the Sunday New York Times. It's only available in print, not available in the electronic version. So here we have extra, extra, the New York Times, read all about it. Editors note this section should not be read by grownups. The vaccine is ready for you. It's the biggest news of all. That is what the New York Times wants to feed the children at the moment. This section, just for the children of the people who are still daft enough to get the hard copy of this paper into their homes on Sundays, um, is what they want the children to be reading. It, it, it's amazing. And I have to say, for anybody who is still uh, towing the party line on this, you need to check in with your understanding of why these vaccines are being recommended for children, healthy children, healthy children, right? This is the strongest indicator that you could get that this isn't about health. This isn't about 
um, protecting children from something. It is about something that has not been described to us. Yep. And the idea that they will go directly to children through the New York Times, mm -hmm. especially in a section that nominally, nominally is not for adults to read. This section should not be read by grownups, well, it says. Right? Yes. Uh, it's... Um, finally, finally. Finally. Kids between 5 and 11 can get the COVID vaccine. Wow. It's what you've all been waiting for. Yeah. Um, this does actually raise a point that I just want to say in passing. I keep forgetting. We have a lighter. It. Can I just burn this? <laughs> um, I am increasingly, uh, I watch my blood pressure go up every time I hear somebody use any version of the term jab. <laughs> I have the feeling that this was somebody's very clever branding and that the idea is it's kind of fun to say jab. I, th I think it actually has a longer history maybe in the UK. Maybe. Yeah. Nonetheless, I would say it A, emphasizes the thing that, of course, naturally people focus on for any vaccination or shot shots, is right? the yeah. needle thing, right? Yeah. Um, and so the point is, oh, you, you can take it. It's just mm -hmm. a jab. It's not so bad. It'll be over quick, right? Mm -hmm. And the point is, no, this has nothing to do with that. This has to do with the immunological consequences and other consequences of the stuff in that syringe. And so, right, but but you can specifically get into kids' heads this way, like, oh, honey, I know you're scared of needles, but right. it's going to be fine. Right. We'll get so, you a lollipop afterwards. I would just ask that people who are anywhere near wanting to do an honest first principles investigation of what the costs and benefits and risks that are associated with this, anybody who is in that group, proper skeptics, need... Be staying in your lane mm -hmm. is saying jab, right? Getting out of your lane involves using any one of a number of perfectly responsible synonyms that are available to you, right? You could call it a shot. You can call it an inoculation. You How about talk. calling it getting stuck? <laughs> I, I would like to stay out of that. I mean, I agree, but I would like to stay out of that territory and just say that the point is whose bidding are you doing when you say jab, right? You're making it cute. Right. Mm -hmm. If there's one thing this is, even if you think this stuff is great and all of those of us who have our doubts are out to lunch, the point is it's still serious business one way or the other. Yeah. So uh, jab, it's uh, it's the wrong term. <laughs>